The Vietnam War would see the realization of the Vietnamese dream of a single, unified, independent country taking its place in the world, free of outside oppression and rule. It is the type of story that has been told throughout history, and had it occurred at any other point in history, then it would have likely been largely forgotten outside of the small Southeast Asian country, as so many wars of independence are. But because of events elsewhere in the world, the battlefields of Vietnam became one of the most important in the world at that time, for it was here that two ideological superpowers, the Democratic West and the Communist East, would throw their weight in, not being able to fight one another directly because they would destroy themselves in a nuclear fire, they instead fought through the Vietnamese people. This is the story of the Vietnam War. In the 17th century, French and Portuguese Catholic missionaries reached Southeast Asia with the aim of spreading Catholicism to the region. At that time, the region was heavily divided between local rulers who frequently fought amongst one another, and so the French deployed troops to protect the missionaries. Over the following 200 years, the French would increasingly involve themselves in the affairs of the region even providing soldiers to aid local warlords who were more willing to cooperate with the French against those who were not. Over time the French gained more and more territory in the region, either through deception, negotiation, or more often than not, through warfare. This culminated in 1887 in the establishment of the Federation of French Colonial Possessions, known as French Indochina. The French colonial government exploited their Asian subjects imposing extortionate taxes on them for key goods, such as salt and opium. French Indochina would expand at the end of the 19th century, with territories ceded from neighbouring Siam in 1893 and then more again in 1907, although in the mid-1930s some of these territories would be returned. However, opposition to the French in the region was never stamped out by the colonial government resulting in several movements being formed, aimed at removing them, and creating a new independent nation. One such movement was the Vietnam Quoc Sen Dan, or simply Viet Quoc. Originating in the city of Hanoi in 1927, the Viet Quoc began a campaign of assassination of French officials, resulting in a brutal crackdown of their members, which saw almost a third of them being arrested by French security forces. This didn't stop their campaign, however, and on February 10th, 1930, they organized a Vietnamese army mutiny at the Yen Bai barracks, which ultimately failed. The French brutally punished members and supporters of the Viet Quoc, putting many of them to death. The Viet Quoc slowly lost its influence afterwards, but another nationalist movement was already gaining support and would dramatically affect the political landscape of the region over the next 30 years. In 1917, Imperial Russia was rocked by revolution, resulting in the overthrowing of the Tsar, and the creation of the world's first communist superpower, the Soviet Union. Many in the Soviet Union wanted to spread their communist ideals beyond their own borders, and instigate a new world order embracing communist ideology, and to achieve this, Soviet leader Vladimir Lenin created the Comintern, an international organization aimed at plotting and supporting more revolutions across the globe. In 1923, a new member arrived in Moscow to receive ideological and practical training, instigating a communist revolution in his homeland of French Indochina. His name, Ho Chi Minh, 
Ho Chi Minh's early life is vague in places, either because of the lack of adequate record keeping amongst Indochina's local population, and sometimes because he would later give contradictory information about his life. His published birth date is May 19th, 1890, and his father was a magistrate in the Binki district, who was eventually dismissed from his post for abusing his power. In 1911, Ho Chi Minh found employment on a French ship under the alias Van Ba to disguise his involvement in anti-slavery protests and working on a variety of ships he widely travelled the globe, visiting among others France, the UK and the USA. In 1919, he returned to France, by which time he was becoming more and more politically minded. He met a group of other Indo-Chinese living in Paris, who as well as advocating for their homeland's independence, they had become enamoured with the ideals of communism, being primarily a rural people and having been oppressed by the imperialist French for so long, the dream of communism, in which power was distributed amongst the people and not an elite few, found fruition amongst many of the indigenous people of Southeast Asia, something that would alarm Western powers, especially the United States in the years to come. While in Paris, Ho Chi Minh campaigned for his people to have a say in the terms of the Versailles Treaty that ended World War I, and appealed to world leaders to push France to grant Indochina independence. The fact that 100,000 men from Indochina had fought for the French in the trenches of the Western Front earned them some support, but both efforts would prove fruitless, although they would raise his profile back home as a man leading the call for freedom. The lack of support from the democratic West only pushed Ho Chi Minh and his compatriots closer to Moscow and communism, and this in turn led him to taking an active role in promoting communism in France itself. In fact, he was one of the founding members of the French Communist Party. In 1923, he began making his way east, posing as a Chinese merchant in order to reach Moscow and attend the Comintern. After that, he made his way to China under a number of aliases and began teaching Indo-Chinese, living there the communist way, and would eventually become the Comintern's senior agent in Southeast Asia. On October 18, 1926, the 36-year-old Ho Chi Ming married a 21-year-old Chinese girl by the name Zheng Wu Ming. Despite protests by his comrades, which he flatly ignored, over the coming decade, Ho Chi Minh would travel the length and breadth of Europe and Asia in the service of world communism, meeting members of communist groups as far afield as France, Belgium, Italy, India, China and Thailand. In his native land, the French were still coming down hard on suspected revolutionaries, making the communist parties in both France and Indochina illegal in 1939 but the French were soon becoming more concerned with the growing threat from Japan and the fear that the communists in China might win the civil war raging there. France itself was plunged into war with Germany in September 1939 and within a year would fall to the German Blitzkrieg. France's empire was now under the control of the Vinci French who had listed military power and so, with little in the way of opposition, the Japanese marched into Indochina on September 22, 1940. The Japanese objective was to blockade supplies to China, whom they had been engaged in war with since 1937. To do this, they occupied the north of the country. However, less than a year later, the Japanese would strike south, capturing the rest of the country, leaving the French authorities as puppets to Tokyo. For the Vietnamese people, Japanese occupation was just as, if not more, brutal as French rule, and Ho Chi Minh and his followers knew that the chaos of the war was the ideal time to strike back at the invaders of their homeland. He therefore reorganized a previously collapsed national group in the Viet Minh, 
which had the goal of pushing back the Japanese and their new French puppets and freeing Indochina to become an independent communist nation. The movement enjoyed popular support, claiming a membership some half a million strong by the end of 1944, thanks to their prioritizing the independence of Vietnam over their own communist agenda, which meant non-communist nationalist groups allied themselves under the Viet Ninh banner. At first, they used weapons smuggled from China or captured from the French and Japanese. But when the US entered the war on September 7, 1941, the Viet Minh began receiving funding and equipment from the United States. The Viet Minh provided a deadly enemy to the Japanese, fully exploiting their knowledge of their own country. Ho Chi Minh established his base in the north near the border with China, so he could meet with his Chinese communist allies regularly. During one such meeting, Ho Chi Minh was captured by the Japanese Kuomintang, the enemies of the Chinese communists in their suspended civil war, and held prisoner until two years later, when he was allowed to return to his home country and continue leading the fight against the Japanese. By 1945, the Japanese were in full retreat across Asia and the Pacific. On March 9th, 1945, they disposed of their French puppets and agreed to break up French Indochina into separate parts, each with their own governments, but allied to China. This saw Laos and Cambodia declare independence, but the recently liberated French made it clear they planned to regain control of their lost territories in the future. This was also a warning for the Viet Minh. Even before the Japanese surrendered, new French officials were parachuted into Indochina by American aircraft, an extremely dangerous task since they were hunted by both the Japanese and Viet Minh. The Viet Minh had waged a brutal four-year campaign against the Japanese and the Vinci French, and were not about to simply let the French take over again. On August 15, 1945, the Japanese in Indochina finally surrendered, and the Viet Minh wasted no time in attempting to secure the country for themselves, before the French could fully reassert themselves. In both the North and South, communist forces under Ho Chi Minh seized towns and cities, and on September 2nd, 1945, he declared that Vietnam was now an independent nation. In his speech, he quoted the American Declaration of Independence. He also quoted a similar sentiment from the French Revolution, perhaps hoping to secure sympathizers from the people who had oppressed them for so long and had themselves been oppressed under Nazi occupation. The problem for Ho Chi Minh was that Vietnam still held thousands of Japanese troops that now needed repatriation to their own country. At the Potsdam Conference, the Allies divided Vietnam along the 16th parallel with China taking responsibility for rounding up the Japanese north of the parallel, and the Allies taking responsibility for the south. Unfortunately for Ho Chi Minh, the British forces that arrived in the south of Vietnam brought with them French troops who immediately began fighting the communists south of the 16th parallel. Managing to hold the north's capital of Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh went about securing his position by eliminating rivals many of whom had fought with the Viet Minh throughout the war. In full control, he knew he had to try to negotiate with the French or face all-out war. War with the Viet Minh was not in the interest of France either, who were locked in negotiation with the Chinese, who demanded the French withdrew from their holdings in Chinese ports in exchange for Chinese troops leaving northern Indochina. It was regarding the latter provision that relations between the French and Ho Chi Minh's government deteriorated. Repeated efforts to agree on how the referendum would be held failed to reach a consensus, and by November 1946, both sides armed for war. After tensions rose to boiling point, open warfare broke out on December 16, 1946, 
The first shot of what history generally refers to as the First Indochina War occurred after the Viet Minh and French soldiers got into an argument in the port city of Haiphong over import tax duty. The French Navy responded by bombarding the Vietnamese section of the city, killing 6,000 people in a single afternoon. The Viet Minh abandoned the city for a time, but had no intention of giving up their claim, and a 300,000 strong force under General Giap launched a counterattack but despite enjoying numerical superiority, the French enjoyed a technological edge and were able to repel Giap's forces. A few weeks later, the Viet Minh were forced to retreat from the cities they held, including Hanoi, and began another guerrilla war in the dense jungles of the countryside. A curious fact about this period is that the Viet Minh's numbers now included former Japanese army members who did not wish to return home to Japan, either because they felt disgrace at having lost the war, or fearing prosecution and even death for war crimes. The French soon adopted a policy of establishing heavy fortified positions in and around towns and cities in an effort to make the Viet Minh attack them where they could be destroyed. The Viet Minh, on the other hand, realized this and limited their attacks to supply lines, leading to these positions effectively laying siege to them. The result was that while it allowed the French to maintain control of key areas, the war became a long drawn out slog with no apparent end in sight. Much of the rest of the world paid little attention to the war in Indochina, but that soon began to change as events elsewhere made the US particularly reassess its view of the situation. The breakdown of relations between Washington and Moscow and the start of the Cold War made American policymakers worry about what a French defeat in Indochina might do regarding the geopolitical map of Asia. If Vietnam became an independent communist nation, then others in the region may follow in a domino effect. This worry was only reinforced when the Chinese Civil War resumed and resulted in a communist victory meaning the Viet Minh now had an undisputed powerful supporter on its northern border. Communist China instead intervened in the North Korean effort to defeat South Korea and its US allies in the Korean War between 1950 and 1953, a conflict that ultimately ended in stalemate. Meanwhile, Washington watched nervously as the French failed to defeat the Viet Minh. France's post-war economy was focused on rebuilding after Nazi occupation, and so the United States began funding France's war against Ho Chi Minh's forces. At one point, the US was funding over 80% of the war effort, but the people of France were growing tired of war and protests against continuing it took place in French cities by 1954. On March 13, 1954, the war was on the verge of its climax, when French paratroopers landed near the village of Dien Bien Phu and established a series of fortified positions. The operation was aimed at cutting off Viet Minh supplies from neighboring Laos, and the paratroopers would be supplied from the air. The French committed over 20,000 men and 400 transport and combat aircraft to the operation, but they faced General Giap and his 49,500 strong forces in the region. The French established their fortified positions and were immediately put under siege by Giap's men, who used anti-aircraft guns to great effect in shooting down the resupply aircraft. The battlefield itself relied heavily on trench warfare such as that seen in World War I, since both sides had an abundance of artillery pieces. With their supplies dwindling amid tenacious Viet Minh assaults, the French lines began to contract further back, until nearly two months of constant fighting, the French garrison was overrun. Nearly 3,000 French soldiers were killed, and nearly 1,200 were marched into prisoner of war camps. It was a devastating blow, and the French Prime Minister resigned immediately afterwards, and his replacement advocated for French troops to withdraw. 
However, they couldn't simply leave the country for Ho Chi Minh's forces to slaughter the remaining Allied French Vietnamese. Thus, at the 1954 Geneva Accords, which ended the fighting, France agreed to withdraw its forces from all its colonies in French Indochina, granting Laos and Cambodia true independence, while stipulating that Vietnam would be temporarily divided at the 17th parallel. Control of the North would be given to the Viet Minh as the Democratic Republic of Vietnam under Ho Chi Minh, while the South would become the state of Vietnam under Emperor Bao Dai. Communist elements in the South would also have to relocate to the North, while large numbers of people in the North relocated South as the result of a CIA operation. Both sides agreed that elections would be held on reunification at some point in the future. It wasn't the total victory Ho Chi Minh had dreamed of, but at least half of his country was now free. Ho Chi Minh now focused on building his new country in the north after the Geneva Accords. And while he never gave up the dream of reunification, he did encourage his people to have patience. He immediately began a diplomatic campaign to secure vital aid from the Soviet Union and his old ally, China, to help prop up the war-ravaged country, which was on the verge of widespread famine. The Soviet Union offered its help in the way of aid and technical assistance to build up infrastructure and the new country's armed forces. North Vietnam already had huge numbers of combat proven and experienced soldiers to form an army. But now the Soviets were helping to establish the North Vietnamese Air Force and Navy as well. Perhaps not wanting to lose influence over Ho Chi Minh, the Chinese offered to match and even better the Soviet offer. In the South, even before the French started pulling out, the United States began dealing with the South Vietnamese government directly, including South Vietnam, joining the US-sponsored Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, a military alliance akin to NATO and Europe, aimed at preventing communism from spreading. As in the North, the South turned to its own Cold War ally for financial and military aid, which, while helped rebuild the country, only further alienated the two sides of the 17th parallel and made the chances of the reunification election all the more difficult. This suited the US because they firmly believed that if the elections were held, then Ho Chi Minh would win, because not just in North and South Vietnam, but the world over, he was seen as the man who freed his people from French opposition. An election victory would give Ho Chi Minh a legitimate claim to all of Vietnam, and as such, the US would lose the country to communism, something that was both politically and military unthinkable. In 1955, a referendum was held in South Vietnam to determine its future governments, which was won by No DDM, defeating Bo Dê, who abdicated, leaving South Vietnam to become a republic. This pleased the US, who saw Diem as someone they could work with and would install a more democratic way of life for those in the South. However, for those who believed Vietnam would be reunified, Diem was an unwelcome arrival, for even before the referendum was held, he declared publicly that he would not entertain the idea of a referendum, citing that he believed no free elections could ever be held in the communist North. But Diem himself was just as guilty of curtailing his own people's democratic freedoms. In fact, the referendum that brought him to power was itself rigged. In Saigon, for example, he claimed over 600,000 votes when there were only 450,000 registered voters in the city. As for implementing Western democracy, he instead used the police and army to clamp down on political rivals remnant Viet Minh and religious groups who didn't subscribe to his Catholicism, such as the Buddhist monks, many of whom would turn to self-immolation in protest. With no elections in sight, the thousands of Viet Minh fighters who relocated north were soon becoming restless, 
agitated and even homesick. They began demanding that Ho Chi Minh's government sponsor an insurgence, but Ho Chi Minh was hesitant to engage in yet another war so soon after North Vietnam had gained independence. Nevertheless, he faced stiff opposition from within his own party, until in January 1959, the North Vietnamese Communist Party elected to begin supporting communist revolution in the South, with over 4,500 southern-born Viet Minh in the North returning to their homeland to begin the campaign. To sit together under the banner of the National Liberation Front, or NLF, violence was quick to take hold, and over the span of a year, there were 1,400 assassinations of government officials in the South. Even without influence from the North, communist and nationalist revolts were breaking out spontaneously in opposition of Dim's government, leaving South Vietnam in a de facto state of civil war. On January 20th, 1961, John F. Kennedy became the 35th President of the United States, and vowed to take a tough stance against the spread of communism. Almost immediately, Kennedy found himself thrust into one of the tensest periods of the Cold War, with the Soviet Union resuming atmospheric nuclear testing, before then closing off East Berlin and building the Berlin Wall. For his part, Kennedy authorized the catastrophic Bay of Pigs invasion in an attempt to overthrow Fidel Castro in Cuba and increase the US defense posture with new military re-equipment programs. While these events took the public light, Kennedy and his staff were increasingly concerned with the unrest and communist insurgents in South Vietnam. In May 1961, Kennedy dispatched his Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson to Vietnam to meet with Dim and pledge even more support to reshape the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, or ARVN, into a more credible fighting force. As well as US military equipment, this included an increasing number of American advisors to train the ARVN in American tactics to combat the NLF, who were referred to by the South and the US as the Viet Cong, or simply VC. Later in the year, the US sponsored the strategic Hamlet program, which aimed to curtail the Viet Cong's ability to recruit from the peasant populations by relocating them from their ancestral lands and into protected hamlets, where as well as security, the peasants would receive government support and education. It was a failure and alienated huge numbers of people, while much of the aid earmarked for the program was embezzled by the corrupt South Vietnamese authorities. Kennedy also authorized Operation Ranch Hand, which involved spraying defoliants and pesticides over the jungle to kill off the dense vegetation in an effort to deprive the Viet Cong of cover and food. Operation Ranch Hand would not be suspended until 1971. With American forces having more and more influence over the ARVN's operations, they undertook more aggressive operations against the Viet Cong, resulting in a series of brutal battles that increasingly used helicopters flown by US pilots. The South Vietnamese undertook search and destroy operations based on intelligence reports of Viet Cong operating in a specific area. Helicopters would fly South Vietnamese troops into the area ahead of an enemy unit while armored units would flank them, forcing them to stand and fight. If the Viet Cong did manage to escape, then the helicopters could fly the South Vietnamese troops ahead of them and ambush them again. At first, the US Army pilots flew their South Vietnamese allies into battle aboard the rather ungainly looking Piyasaki CH-21C helicopter. But increasing numbers of newer, smaller, and faster BAL UH-1 Iroquois began to arrive, which would later become one of the most enduring symbols of the war itself. The Iroquois was known as the Huey to its pilots, after it was initially designated HU-1, while the designation was later switched around, the name stuck. The Huey would prove easily adaptable and could carry out a wide variety of roles, from basic troops transport to casualty evacuation, and later be developed into a flying gunship armed with rockets, guns, 
and grenade launchers. It would even serve as the basis for the dedicated AH-1 Huey Cobra gunship, the forerunner to today's AH-64 Apache. The early search and destroy operations were quite successful, and as well as hurting the Viet Cong, they also raised South Vietnamese morale. The Viet Cong leadership knew they had to change tactics to combat the helicopters, and one of the key changes they made was to instead of trying to run away from the landing zones, they would instead ambush the helicopters as they landed, where the South Vietnamese troops would be bunched up and out in the open, making themselves easy targets. These new tactics saw a reversal of fortunes for the South Vietnamese at the Battle of Ap Bac on January 2nd, 1963. The South Vietnamese would lose five helicopters and eight more damaged, as well as 83 soldiers killed when they were ambushed. Morale in the South began to fall once again, and as before, the frustration was focused on Dim's corrupt government. Although he believed in the importance of the US mission in South Vietnam, Kennedy quietly voiced his concerns about their chances of ultimate success. He is reported to have said in 1963, we don't have a prayer of staying in Vietnam, those people hate us. But he was trapped by the upcoming election, which he knew he would lose if he pulled out US support, looking weak to his political enemies. He did however plan a moderate downscaling of US advisors in Vietnam, which would be completed by the end of 1965 after the election. It was clear that Ding had to go, but he refused to step down when the US began pushing him to. In October 1963, the US learned of a military coup being formulated against Diem, led by General Duong Van Minh. Kennedy decided to support the coup, and on November 1st, 1963, Minh's soldiers arrested Dim and his brother before murdering them, something Kennedy was appalled over. Three weeks later, Kennedy himself was assassinated in Texas, and Lyndon Johnson assumed the presidency. Despite his own personal reservations, one of the first things President Johnson did regarding Vietnam was to reverse Kennedy's decision to begin withdrawing US advisors from Vietnam, which at that time numbered some 15,000 troops. In the wake of the coup against him, a military junta was installed in Saigon, under General Doug Van Min, but within three months, he was himself toppled in yet another coup, led by Ning Khan, another officer in the ARVN. Khan's coup saw several leading figures in General Min's government murdered, and soon Saigon was rocked by riots, violence, and more Buddhist protests. The instability in Saigon worried Johnson, but with the 1964 elections looming, he too couldn't afford to look weak on foreign policy, and so he had to keep up the effort against the Viet Cong and their supporters in the North. His chance to demonstrate his resolve against the communists in Southeast Asia came in August 1964. On August 2nd, the US Navy destroyer USS Maddox was conducting a signals intelligence patrol in the Gulf of Tonkin off North Vietnam, intercepting military radio transmissions following a South Vietnamese commando raid on a radar installation base on Hon Mai Island. Three North Vietnamese P-4 torpedo boats approached the Maddox, which responded by firing three warning shots. The North Vietnamese boats replied with torpedoes and machine gun fire, prompting the Maddox to fire directly on them. When the boats were first sighted, a flight of four F-8 Crusaders were launched from the aircraft carrier, USS Ticonderoga, and as the shooting began, they were ordered to attack the torpedo boats. In the exchange of fire, one Crusader was damaged, as were all three North Vietnamese torpedo boats, with four of their crew being killed. The Maddox itself only received a single hit from a machine gun bullet. On August 4th, the Maddox accompanied by a second destroyer carried out another patrol off the North Vietnamese coast in order to demonstrate that the previous attack would not deter the US Navy. The ships detected torpedo boats on radar and fired upon them, claiming they had sunk two. 
However, it's now widely accepted that no attack took place, since no wreckage or bodies were ever found, and that the radar targets they were shooting at were false, a result of poor weather at the time. Nevertheless, to the American people, the US Navy had been attacked twice, and Johnson had to respond in force. On August 10th, even as details of what had happened in both incidents were still being disseminated, the US Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, authorizing Johnson to take military action against North Vietnam and the Viet Cong. Johnson wasted no time in deploying additional troops to South Vietnam, with numbers reaching 23,000 by the end of the year, under the command of General William Westmoreland. Additional combat aircraft were also deployed, including a number of B-57 Canberra bombers to Ben Hoa Air Base. On November 1st, these bombers became the target of a Viet Cong mortar attack, which saw five of them destroyed and 13 other damaged, with four airmen being killed. Two days later, on November 3rd, Johnson won an overwhelming victory in the 1964 election, while polls showed that around half of the population supported his military action in Vietnam. As American support for the South ramped up, Plans were made for a sustained air campaign against the North. The air campaign was designed to demonstrate that the United States had total control of the air and could attack anywhere at any time. It was hoped by demonstrating this that the North Vietnamese people would first lose faith in Ho Chi Minh's government and secondly, lose the will to continue the war. It was also aimed to improve morale in the South and discourage support for the Viet Cong on both sides of the DMZ. Airstrikes were also ordered against the Ho Chi Minh trial in Laos and its endpoints in South Vietnam, but not in Cambodia, which was officially neutral. The US Air Force and Navy leaderships had a clear military strategy in mind for combating the North. However, they found that the White House intended to keep them on a very tight leash. Every target had to be specifically authorized by the White House before it could be attacked, and the pilots were forced to operate under extremely strict rules of engagement. The White House reasoning for these restrictions was that they were acutely aware of thousands of Chinese and Soviet advisors training the North Vietnamese in opening their equipment to use against the Americans. This included MiG fighters and the new deadly surface-to-air missile systems known as SAMs. Johnson and his staff feared that if these Soviet advisors were killed by American bombs, then it would widen the war with direct Soviet involvement and maybe even lead to a global confrontation. This meant that US pilots were forbidden from attacking the MiG bases or the SAM sites. As for the targets selected, they were often of questionable value and targets in and around Hanoi and the port city of Haiphong were strictly prohibited. According to US Air Force historian Earl Tilford, targeting bore little resemblance to reality in that the sequence of attacks was uncoordinated and the targets were approved randomly, even illogically. Operation Rolling Thunder was officially authorized on February 24, 1965, with the first attack occurring on March the 2nd when 100 US and Vietnamese Air Force planes attacked an ammunition base at Zong Bang. With the MiG bases spared, it meant the North Vietnamese Air Force were free to attack the American formations at will. The North Vietnamese Air Force was primarily equipped with the primitive Soviet-built gun-armored MiG-17 Fresco, but were also receiving growing numbers of the more advanced MiG-21 Fishbed that could carry two short-range air-to-air missiles. By contrast, the US could field the extremely advanced F-4 Phantom II, which served with both the Air Force and Navy, and could carry eight air-to-air -air missiles, four of which could be fired at targets beyond the range of the pilot's own eyesight, being guided by its sophisticated onboard radar. On paper, the F-4 should have been able to decimate the mix. However, the White House rules of engagement demanded that the US pilots visually identify any aircraft they intended to attack, which completely negated the advantage of these long-range missiles in case the aircraft were Chinese, Soviet, or civilian. 
At such close ranges, dogfights would break out between the American planes and the midges. But the F-4 was at a significant disadvantage, being heavier and less nimble than the smaller midge. Even more of a problem, the US pilots had done little training in dogfighting tactics, instead focusing on using their missiles. But the missiles themselves were not always reliable. The North Vietnamese often resorted to their guns and inflicted losses on the Americans, who on some variants of the Phantom didn't even have their own gun. This forced a major rethink of US training doctrines, and for the US Navy, the painful experiences over Vietnam in those early days led to the formation of the now legendary Top Gun School. The Vietnamese did have their own training problems, however, and that was that they simply didn't have enough pilots qualified to fight the Americans. Research in the 21st century has discovered that to help shore up the number of available pilots, a number of North Korean pilots volunteered to fly with the North Vietnamese Air Force as part of a secret deal between the two countries. The North Koreans wanted the conflict in Vietnam to divert US attention away from the Korean Peninsula, and so some of the country's best pilots were sent, 14 of which have now been listed as killed in action. But MiGs were only part of the threat for the US pilot. The most feared weapon, by far, was the Soviet-supplied SAMs, such as the SA-2 Guideline, which possessed a large warhead, and it was not uncommon for one SAM to destroy two, or even three US planes flying in tight formation. The only defense in the early days was for the US planes to dive into the SAM and try to outmaneuver it. However, this upset the attack force's cohesion, and also the reduction in altitude from carrying out the maneuver sometimes put them in range of North Vietnamese anti-aircraft guns. Later in the war, dedicated jamming aircraft would be developed to disrupt the radar sets guiding the missiles, and eventually missiles that could hone in on them. With all these restrictions in place, the US pilots quickly became disillusioned with their mission under Rolling Thunder, renaming it Rolling Blunder. They often likened the operation to fighting a war with one hand tied behind their backs. For the planners at the White House, their overly optimistic projections regarding the breakdown of Ho Chi Minh government soon passed, and this saw them extend the operation beyond the initially projected eight weeks, and this would be pushed back again and again, going to months and eventually years. To counter the US raids, the Viet Cong began a campaign of attacks against the air bases in South Vietnam, like they had done against Ben Hoa. These attacks caused General Westmoreland to request additional troops to protect them, and President Johnson thus authorized a further expansion of the ground forces in South Vietnam. Meanwhile, the US pilots continued their campaigns, pressing home their attacks with extraordinary bravery, considering the problems in planning. Eventually, 643,000 tons of bombs were dropped, but at the cost of nearly 900 US aircraft. A truly staggering figure. One notable pilot involved in Rolling Thunder was future presidential Republican candidate John McCain, flying a US Navy A-4 Skyhawk. On October 26, 1967, he was shot down by a SAM and would spend six years as a prisoner of war. In South Vietnam, General Westmoreland adopted the general tactic of overwhelming the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese army, who were now filtering down south to join the insurgents with superior numbers and above all, superior firepower. The French had proven the effectiveness of artillery against them and the ARVN had enjoyed successes in the early search and destroy sweeps, using helicopters to encircle enemy formations. Westmoreland saw both the advantages and limitations of helicopter-borne operations and quickly conceived counters to the new tactics the Viet Cong were using against the landing zones. Since there were only so many natural landing spots for helicopters, it was easy for the Viet Cong to predict where the American troops would land and set up ambushes, as they had done to great effect at Apback. To counter this, the areas around the landing zones were subjected to powerful artillery and airstrikes to hold back the Viet Cong lying in wait while the helicopters touched down and unloaded the troops 
Later, the US would employ very high explosives, such as BLU-82, which was nicknamed the Daisy Cutter by troops, to destroy large areas of jungle, to create a landing zone. All landings had to be carried out at high speed, with the helicopters touching down for barely a few seconds before lifting off again. US troops were trained to spread out as quickly as possible once on the ground, so that mortars or machine gun fire couldn't kill numerous US troops in a single strike. The US began their own large-scale search and destroy missions, and made great use of tanks, helicopters and artillery, and air power. The US troops were also joined by contingents of Australia, New Zealand and South Korean troops, although hopes British troops would be deployed were soon dashed by London. Westmoreland explained to Washington and his men that the goal would be to kill more Viet Cong than they could replace, while airstrikes in the north would theoretically bring Ho Chi Minh to the peace table. The communists would therefore be forced to give up their aim of conquering the south. In order to destroy such numbers of enemies, however, he would have to engage them in large, pitched battles where they could be overwhelmed and destroyed. This was something the Viet Cong could not let them do. North Vietnamese General Giap had conceived of four key points with which to combat the Americans and the South Vietnamese. If the enemy advances, we retreat. If the enemy halts, we harass. If he avoids battle, we attack. If the enemy retreats, we attack. By following these basic principles, the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese army were always able to prevent themselves from getting drawn into the type of battles Westmoreland desired. Instead, they could always dictate when and where battles would start and when it would end. It was extremely frustrating for US commanders the US troops soon came to refer to their guerrilla enemy as Charlie, which came about from the NATO phonetic alphabet for VC, Victor Charlie, with the Victor eventually having been dropped for expediency. With the US troops now locked in the ground war for South Vietnam, the question of how long a soldier would have to serve their tour of duty was settled on 12 months for the US Army and 6 months for the Marines who would then get a reprieve before returning for another six months. Both branches, however, had incentive programs designed to encourage experienced soldiers to extend their tours so they could pass on their experience to new arrivals from the US. The fighting in Vietnam was unlike most other conflicts the US had found itself embroiled in. There was no front line, and by that end, no real safe zone behind the lines. Instead, there was what the US termed as area war, meaning sections of the country were contested, usually around strategically important targets, such as Saigon. In the south of the country, the Viet Cong were most prevalent, while in the central highlands and near the DMZ, the North Vietnamese army was increasingly more active, often fighting alongside local Viet Cong, and all were supplied by the Ho Chi Minh trial. In terms of hardware, the ground war in Vietnam was a clash of two iconic rifles. The North Vietnamese made extensive use of the AK-47 assault rifle, which was designed in the Soviet Union after the Second World War, and inspired by a German rifle called the STG-44. The AK-47 is one of history's most prolific and successful weapons, being built in the millions, not just in the Soviet Union, but in numerous other countries and continue to see service the world over almost 75 years later. The typical image of the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese army invariably includes its members carrying this recognizable weapon. The AK-47 fired a 7.62mm round out to a range of about 350 meters and had a fire rate of 600 rounds a minute. It was a relatively heavy weapon, but the key to its success was its reliability, even in the harsh jungle environment of the Vietnam countryside, where it was exposed to mud and rain on a daily basis. When US troops first arrived in Vietnam, they were armed with the M14 battle rifle, which replaced the World War II era M1 Garand rifle. It fired a similar size 7.62mm round, but was heavier than the AK-47, although it enjoyed greater accuracy over longer ranges. However, US Air Forces were soon re-equipped 
with a new weapon that would become just as iconic as the AK-47, namely the M16. The M16 was lighter than either the M14 or AK-47, leading some older soldiers to describe it as being akin to a BB gun. And while it fired a smaller 5.56 round, it had a higher rate of fire and accuracy. When M14 production looked as though it couldn't meet demand with US forces, US Defense Secretary Robert McNamara ordered a halt to any more orders and concentrated on M16 production. The weapon's introduction to combat in Vietnam was not an overwhelming success. Unlike the AK-47, the M16 suffered from chronic reliability issues from combat in the jungle. Stoppages sometimes occurred after only 1,000 rounds had been fired without intensive maintenance by the troops, leading some units to discard the new weapon and reopen their stocks of M14s. In combat, it was not uncommon for US troops to pick up AK-47s from dead enemy soldiers. A crash program was instigated to address the reliability problems resulting in the M16A1 model, and American soldiers finally had confidence in the new weapon. By 1969, the M16A1 had displaced the M14 as the standard weapon of US and Vietnam forces. As the months passed by, US troop numbers increased, reaching 385,000 by the end of 1966, thanks to an influx of soldiers drafted to fight the war. But so too did the casualties. In 1966 alone, the US suffered over 6,000 dead, and while estimates put the Viet Cong's dead at over 61,000, their overall numbers had actually increased, and much of that surge in volunteers was thanks in part to the Americans themselves and their use of artillery and airstrikes across the country. As Joseph Galloway, an award-winning journalist for UPI during the conflict explained in a 1995 documentary for the Discovery Channel, you've got a farmer and he is paying taxes to both sides and he's doing his best to get by and you come along in your helicopter and strafes his area and kill his water buffalo. Boy, that makes him angry. You just hurt his rice ball. How is he going to farm without his tractor, which is his water buffalo? You come along with the Air Force and you drop a bomb down his smokestack and kill his wife and kids. You've just made a Viet Cong. General Westmoreland was forced to admit that his timetable for achieving victory had long slipped away because the communists refused to meet him in open battle like he had hoped. Worse still, their use of intricate tunnels, booby traps, mortars, and snipers was taking a heavy toll on the American troops, whose morale, particularly amongst those who had been drafted to serve in Vietnam, was beginning to fall. After explaining this in a meeting with Defense Secretary Robert McNamara in 1967, Robert suggested to Johnson that in the short term, even more troops were needed, while a long-term plan should be established to train the South Vietnamese to take over more of the combat role, affording the US an eventual exit from the war. Johnson agreed, and numbers of US troops rose again, eventually peaking at half a million in 1968. It would be easy to suggest that the US were failing, but in fact, they had scored several significant victories across South Vietnam against the communists. While the communists continued their policy of refusing to meet in open battle, preferring a fast, ambush style of warfare, American and South Vietnamese forces succeeded in destroying or capturing huge numbers of supplies. Disrupting the communist command structure and destroying bases of operation, particularly in the so-called Iron Triangle near Saigon. In one operation dubbed Operation Junction City, 240 helicopters along with paratroopers and hundreds of armored vehicles the largest airborne operation since World War II, killed over 2,700 Viet Cong in the Tay Ninh province for the loss of 282 Americans. The problem was, of course, these numbers were a drop in the ocean as far as defeating the Viet Cong, when those overall numbers were estimated to be over a quarter of a million at the time. This excludes the North Vietnamese army, but while Johnson, McNamara, and Westmoreland were satisfied to play the long game, the American people were growing impatient as more and more of their sons came home in body bags. In 